Society here, and we are starting our new latest film series, which is courtroom legal dramas. Yay. We figured we'd better start out with pretty much one of the best ones ever, uh, 12 Angry Men. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people have seen this film before? Oh, yeah. Quite a few? Okay, quite a few have seen this movie before. Good, good. Well, then you'll know how it goes, so I won't have to spoil too much then. <laughs> but, um, you know, add memory. Okay, well, that works perfect. That's great perfect. <laughs> but uh, the fun thing about 12 Angry Men, uh, you know, when we started this series, we knew we were going to have to start with this movie. We'd have to have this in the series, because uh, the movie is not just considered one of the best legal dramas of all time. It's often cited as one of the best movies of all time. It yeah. frequently makes the, whenever they do rankings of the top 100 best films, it's always in there. It's almost always in there. Other rankings, it makes one of the ones that I get a kick out of. Um, American Film Institute did a ranking of the greatest film heroes of all time. <laughs> juror number eight is like number 37. <laughs> they put number, juror number eight, he totally made the list. He played by Henry Fonda, he's fantastic. Uh, Fonda would go on to say this is probably one of his best roles he ever had, although he, he did struggle when he was doing this movie because uh, Fonda was also the producer of this film. And it was the only time he was ever a producer on a film because he hated it so much. It was very hard for him to do it. But the origins of this uh, movie are pretty interesting. It, uh, it actually started the uh, poster, person who wrote it, the screenplay, Reginald Rose wrote it. Uh, Rose got the idea after being on a juror. He was a juror in a, I think it was actually a manslaughter case in that case. But he just realized there was a lot of drama in there just when they had to hash it out. So he kind of based it off of that. And after he wrote it, he wrote the script actually for television. And it did appear on television as a TV teleplay in 1954. That's the first time this was ever produced for anything. But Something like that, I think so. One of the weird things is after it was produced for television in 1954, <coughs> it was really successful. It did well on television. It aired on CBS, actually. Um, they, but they lost some of the original prints. And for a while there, they thought that original screening was gone and lost to all history. Someone found it a few years ago, thank God. So they're probably, you can check it out. Um, it was a completely different cast in 1954, but, and I'm not sure who was all in that. And it had been made on for television with commercial breaks, I'm sure. But it was so successful, and there was other stage productions afterwards, because it's a very, very easy movie to turn into a play, which it has been done. Um, so they thought, uh, uh, the U United Artists kind of got the idea that maybe we should do a film. This could work for film very well. <coughs> and Henry Fonda was kind of approached, I think he was approached to produce it, help make, get it made. And he said it was difficult, and he struggled with it a lot, and that's why he never produced anything else later in life, but he was really proud of it. One of the things that he did that was very wise is he hired Sidney Lumet to direct mm -hmm. this film. This is the first film Sidney Lumet had ever directed. He did television before that, but he started with this. Lumet did such a good job that he pretty much became typecast as the guy you get to direct flaw films. He directed flaw films his entire life. Just, I, I couldn't even begin to list it, but if you're watching a legal thriller, there's a good chance Sidney Lumet directed it. Mm -hmm. um, he was doing them all the way up until like, 2010, actually. He's still doing it. He's pretty good at it. But, uh, of course, for any of the plot of this one, which is, uh, we have just a 90 minute movie that's basically set entirely in one room with mm -hmm. jury boxes. Yep. They deliberate on it. Mm -hmm. And the movie kind of breaks all the rules in that one of the rules of fiction is show, don't tell. This is all tell because we never actually see the trial that they're <laughs> debating, or, of course, the case. Or really, we only get a brief glimpse of the defendant, even. So it's just these 12 men who, again, we don't ever really learn their names either. We just get their juror number because they don't need to say their names at any point. And it's just pure drama, just one 90-minute argument, basically, where you get to hear all these different personalities. We get some of the greatest ensemble actors of the 50s. Now, what I didn't realize this when I first saw it, but I, when I was researching it, some of these actors, they weren't all that well-known. Um, Henry Fonda was at the time. But a lot of these actors, this was some of their early work. They did, they become more popular later on. We got juror number five is played by Jack Klugman. Oh, uh, sure. He had a lot of good roles later on. He was he was about 35 when he did this movie, but he was still kind of going up there. And a lot of these actors became, this became how they got typecast later on, too, because they're like, oh, you were in 12 Angry Men? Okay, we want to play that kind of role. Um, juror, number, juror number four, uh, his name at the time, but um, he was funny because he later on played a, a defense attorney 
Kenny and uh, FD and Joe uh, with, uh, with this for the defense there. Uh, there was an ongoing TV series. He got famous as an attorney on television later on, which is funny. Um, one of the ones that makes me laugh here, because I can't unhear it, um, um, I think he had already done this before the movie. I can't remember. Um, juror number two, if his voice sounds familiar, he's the voice of Piglet in Winnie the Pooh. Cool. Uh, and, like, and, and he doesn't change his voice. It's like, is that Piglet there? <laughs> um, uh, it's just really funny. Um, but you see all these great uh, actors who've got in here, and it's just a powerhouse of it. And this film did get nominated for several Oscars, including Best Picture, uh, Best Director, Best Screenplay. And it is it was a hit right off that. It wasn't a huge financial success because, and Henry Fonda would argue with the studios later on that they didn't promote it that much. And even after it got nominated for Best Picture, they didn't put it back in theaters, which is what you standardly do. Um, part of the other problem is, though, it's not a film. It's not, it, you may notice this when you watch it, it looks pretty good on this screen but it's not really cut for a huge, giant screen necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, it does look pretty good uh, when we watch it. I was just watching a few clips of it. It looks pretty nice to get some good crisp and like, but uh, it's not something that people necessarily would go to a big theater to watch. I think that might have been part of the problem later on. But it works very well on television or at home, and so it caught on a second light so that way. Unfortunately, no, which is one of the shocking things. And I was gonna look up what actually won. I'll probably do that before we get back here, but. It, one of the things that I do know is it didn't get any acting nods, which is shocking because there's some very good acting in this movie. So um, I'm kind of surprised it didn't, but I think that's usually what holds them back when you don't get an acting nod. They tend to give the big awards to ones that have actors in there too. But the film did get a good following later on and recycled on TV. And then, of course, people did say that adaptation film too is pretty easy to do that. Just get 12 actors. You can get a big cast, 12 actors in there. Really strong. Everybody gets their big moment there, <laughs> and the movie gets to you know live on as just it gets used a lot in, as educational too. I'm surprised a lot of the people I talked to about this movie first saw this in high school in a film class. Mm -hmm. This is like the, they get shown it as in class, in like an English class or a film early introduction to film class. This is one of the first films they show you, or, or even law classes sometimes. Although there's some question about the. Um, that's not exactly how jury procedure should go. There's some question about that. Like, technically that would disqualify, and that doesn't, so there's some arguments to that. But it has inspired other people, and like, uh, including, uh, um, I was reading, like, there were Supreme Court justices who went into law after seeing this film. Oh, definitely. So it, it helped that way. And one of the ones that really shocked me is this, the script, the actual screenplay and the, the stage direction is often used to teach people English. In other countries, they sure. actually use it a lot. Mm -hmm. It works, and I'm like, I was kind of confused. Why? Why is this used as an English language tool? It's because there's so many different nouns. Like they're explaining stuff and direction and where things are. You know, it just it works well. It's like to do that, you can conjugate different <laughs> words that would pop up. So it's like there's so many different, there's so many words to, to itself in there. So you're covering a large basis of stuff. So it's just that helps out a lot. So it's, it works well for like you know, teaching people who are who have come to the United States and want to learn English or just other stuff like that. And I and then I realized juror number 11 is an immigrant too. Uh, and it's just, um, and he has one of the better lines in the whole movie where he's talking about how great the American system is, that we have a jury system. Yeah. We get to do, to do that. It's one of the better speeches in the whole movie. And it's something. Um, one of the other things is, I would argue this is one of the better, more patriotic, make the United States look good kind of movies too. It works well for that. It's like really see, it, you can see our judicial system at its best and it's very positive and how we can do that to get past bias. It's pretty positive in that sense and it's kind of a in, very inspiring film too, which is why I think it still resonates and it uh, still works to this day even though the movie's over 60 <coughs> years old at this point still works and they can still do adaptations of it and they make it pretty it's not don't take too much work to add a, adapt it to the modern times but um it's one of those films that uh, i would have every now and then watch when i'd be typing up stuff for <coughs> work or whatever have it in the background but i had to stop doing that because um it's too distracting the movie's too good <laughs> the dialogue gets, gets you riveted and you just can't go away so that's one of the things that i like about it so much but we'll can talk a little bit more about some of the fun little facts and some of that one thing to watch for in the movie is the camera angle, where the camera is. Yes. You'll notice when the movie starts that the camera angle is actually above eye level, looking down kind of on the guys. The 
camera angle will slowly change and get slower as the movie goes. And there's a reason they do that, and it's pretty interesting stuff. And it's kind of one of the reasons Clement got best directing nod because he knew what he was doing with the camera because he's got one really tight room and he only has limited space, but he uses it quite well to really push the emotion. So, but we'll get that going right there. So enjoy. Yeah.